right. Welcome to another episode of Valued Pursuit. This is episode 11. My name is Patrick. I'm here with my co-host, Tyler. Tyler, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Very excited. I know this is probably a little bit delayed from the last one in terms of time that we've posted, but as long as we don't stop and keep moving forward, that's our goal. We're going to get to 100 episodes. Yeah, Confucius. My, well, I, I, as you know, I love quotes. You know, it doesn't matter how slow you go so long as you do not stop. Yeah. Um, very, very exciting episode today. Tyler being a physical therapist, myself being a strength coach, sports nutritionist, but then college professor. I'm the program director at St. Joe's University for the exercise physiology program. Today, we're going to talk about health, but health through fitness. And then we're going to get into sort of a two part series. Today, we're going to talk all about the general principles of yes, health, but really fitness, exercise, physical activity, what all these things mean. We'll talk about habits, systems, you know, and, and why certain things are important, different types of exercise, and how they relate to different aspects of health, quality of life, quantity of life, et cetera. And then in part two, we're going to get into, okay, now you know all that information. What are we going to do with it? How are you going to actually implement things like this? So we'll get into exercise testing and prescription programming, things like that. So I'm very excited to dive in. This is a topic that I teach, a topic that I practice, you know, something that is at the forefront of, in general, all of health slash fitness or health as it relates to fitness, overall movement, physical activity, and things like that. And that's what we want to sort of dive in and really get into and explain it in a simplistic manner so that everyone can understand it and everyone can also then realize that what we have to say today applies to everyone. It doesn't matter if who's listening or who you know that's not listening. What we talk about today will apply or can apply to every single person on earth. Everyone should be moving. Movement is life. So let's get into it. You ready, Tyler? I'm ready. Exercise is medicine. Let's do this. Absolutely. So the, the first thing we wanted to talk about was this idea of, okay, we want to be healthy. The World Health Organization defines health as a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not simply a lack of disease. You know, and the idea is, well, you know, I, I, do you feel healthy? Oh, I, I feel healthy because I'm not bleeding. You know, even if you're taking, I don't, I haven't had to go to the doctor like today. I don't need to go to the ER. Even if you are taking meds, it's like, well, I'm taking these meds and uh, everything seems to be okay. My values have stabilized and things like that. That doesn't mean you are in optimal health. And that doesn't mean that your health, wherever you are on that health spectrum, could not get better. So you then get into activities of daily life, quality of life. But referencing, this is where Tyler and I were chatting and where we wanted to start is this aspect of, well, we want to improve our health and we're going to talk about physical health today. What does physical activity mean? What is exercise? A lot of people say, oh, I, my New Year's resolution is I want to be healthier. I want to get into better shape. What does that mean? I want to be in better shape. Oh, I need to exercise more. What does that mean? What is exercise? So Tyler, what, what do you think of when you hear the terms exercise and physical activity? Yeah, so we were chatting about this before and I think physical activity, I'm thinking more of like movement-based. Uh, I think that's a better way to describe that as like your activities of daily living is what we say in physical therapy. So what do you have to do when you wake up to when you go to sleep, right? To just accomplish your daily tasks of everyday life. Versus exercise, when I think of that, I'm thinking of like, okay, I'm going to the gym, I'm training for maybe a race or for uh, to be able to go and again, like we said, all ages, this applies to play with my grandkids, be able to go out into the, the backyard during barbecues this summer and being able to, you know, stand for an hour or be able to, you know, go on a walk with my family or whatever it is. There's actual structure to it. So Whereas physical activity is something that you're just what you need to do on a daily basis through the foods that you're eating and the calories that you're expending to basically be able to not have any kind of limitations through uh, your daily activities, right? Your activities of daily living. So there's more structure to exercise. And we have the definitions too we were talking about before, whereas exercise is a type of physical activity. And you made the point of this before, right? That um, 
exercise and physical activity are not the same thing. What, what were you saying before with oh, before the idea would be if someone says I'm going to exercise by default, you are saying I'm going to be physically act active. I'm doing right. physical activity, but I'm just doing physical activity that is structured. So if I want to go to the gym for 30 minutes, you're going to do physical activity there, but it's considered exercise because it is planned and because it is structured. So right. we can show, I'll pull up. So I'm going to show a slide real quick. There's a slide, you know, that, that I'll use in class that I'll do when I present and give workshops and things like that, that sort of define the differences. And one of the things that we want to do is we're not into like these fancy buzzwords to try and capture your attention by saying everything you're doing is wrong or you're not doing enough, but there might be some merit to, and we'll get into this. If you're just, on a lunch break, going outside and just walking, that walking is very beneficial. But we, what we say in the fitness world, there's going to be a law of diminishing returns. And, and we'll get into that in a second. But here's a slide that uh, we, I really, we really want to show. And, and this will kind of talk about what we mean when we're getting into this concept. So we've got a slide that where we can show, hey, here's physical activity, here's exercise. We have a little thing about health and then we'll talk about fitness because the whole point is to do these things in order to continually or initially improve your fitness and then hopefully continually improve your fitness. So here we're gonna show the difference in physical activity. So when we say physical activity, most of what we're referring to is bodily movement. So we want to do bodily movement and that bodily movement involves contraction of our skeletal muscles all over our body. That movement, contraction of skeletal muscle that results in this substantial increase in caloric requirements. So we're increasing our energy expenditure, increasing your heart rate. You're going to increase your you know, respiratory rate, your breathing rate. You're going to increase it to a certain degree that gets over what we call a threshold. So you don't need to know all those fancy terms because someone who's out of shape is gonna have a much lower threshold than someone who's you know, like an elite marathoner. Their threshold is gonna be at a much higher level. And what we mean by these thresholds is how high do you need to get your heart rate, energy expenditure to tell your body and overload your body enough that it crosses a threshold that now gets your body to want to adapt and respond. So in the exercise phys world, strength and conditioning, whatever, we'll talk about like acute responses and acute responses, any bodily movement. Hey, I'm going to start, you know, walking up and down the stairs. I'm going to start jogging. I'm going to start, you know, picking up these weights. We're doing physical activity and we're getting our heart rate up and oxygen up to a certain degree that's going to then overload our system and now our system's going to want to adapt to get a little bit better next time as opposed to if you were just going to stand there hey i stood all day i'm really tired i was on my feet standing all day and if you're just walking around depending on your level of fitness a majority of people we could say you weren't really physically active today you moved but we're not calling that and labeling that physical activity because you didn't hit a certain intensity, which is even a very low intensity. You didn't get low enough or get high enough to hit that low intensity in order to elicit enough of a hormonal response that tells your body then in the 12 to 24 hours post, we need to recover from that and make ourselves better. Because if someone listening is, oh, I'm on my feet 12 hours every single day, and you say, oh, well, like I'm really tired, my joints hurt, my back hurt, and things like that. Well, I thought physical activity is supposed to help me. But yet, if you're saying, I am physically active because I'm on my feet for 12 hours, well, that's where the concept is. You're not really physically active. So it's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people to hear that. But that idea that you need to get to a certain intensity, and that intensity is not very high, but it's it's probably more, it's definitely more than you just standing there. And it's probably more than you just casually walking in your neighborhood, around your block, at a lunch break, things like that. And then you get into, that's the physical activity. You then get into the second bullet point, which is just exercise. Exercise is a type of physical activity consisting of plan structure. 
you know, repetitive bodily movements done. And then you have a specific focus. So that focus is to improve your fitness. And by improving your physical fitness, I already explained that the World Health Organization, by improving your physical fitness, that's almost exclusively going to improve your overall health. And then you just say health, the ability to perform normal activities of daily living without undue physiological or emotional stress, you know, on my overall health. And you can get into what is health. Well, we already said world health, but what's my cardiovascular health? What is my metabolic health? My, you know, glucose, my blood lipids, my blood pressure, stuff like that. You get into all of those things and then you have fitness. Hey, I want to be more fit. What does that mean? Well, that's a set of attributes, characteristics that you have that allows you to be able to carry out certain types of physical activity, certain types of movement. We get into the idea of fitness. Well, are you cardiovascularly fit? Do you have a lot of endurance or are you muscularly fit? Are you fit from the standpoint of flexibility? And this is a big thing that Tyler and I are going to get into. Tyler, what do you, what do you anything you want to add? Well, I think the point that you made before was good because physical activity is seen in its description, obviously, and then also in exercise, but exercise is not seen in physical activity. So you made the point before where it's like, all right, well, I move a lot, but I'm not feeling better, right? In my like daily activities, whether most of the time people say their work, it's active. But if it's not planned, structured and focused on the things that you actually need to improve, and we'll get into like the fit principle, uh, your frequency, intensity, time and type, like actually having, like Patrick just said, enough stimulus for your body to make an adaptation. And the concept is, is for you to make an adaptation for you to become more fit for what, what you just said, you define fitness. So you're able to do your activities of daily living, your physical activity with ease, right? It, it, you're more efficient. So you, you talked about before the Goldilocks rule, before we uh, started recording, and I think that's a good point is our body always wants to be in homeostasis and homeostasis is like you can think of equilibrium. So it's always trying to keep everything kind of out of balance when you're doing exercise, right, and not just going to work, whether it be and some people's work is like very active, right? Like if you're a firefighter or maybe you're a coach of a sport and you have to move around a lot and you have to run back and forth with like athletes or you're a trainer, or you know, you're I have patients that are, you know, on stage crew, like I said, and they're lifting things and carrying things, whatever it is, right? Those are valid things to be moving and be functioning for. But again, exercising is going to be planned and structured and actually specific to what you need to improve upon. So again, body wants to stay in balance. If you have pain and you have impairments, you're out of balance. Well, what do we actually need? to improve upon to fix those imbalances. And that's when exercise comes in. And Patrick made the point too before we recorded was hiring a professional to help you in whatever it is that you're limited. So do you need to lose weight? Maybe you can hire a personal trainer or a nutritionist or a dietitian. Uh, if you have some sort of musculoskeletal pain or ailment, right? You can maybe go to a physical therapist. These people are trained to be able to prescribe those particular exercises that are going to help you with those and balances that you have. And again, going back to why you need exercise, because you need things that are at a certain threshold, intensity, frequency, time and type, which we'll talk about more, mm -hmm. but just to mention, to have the body make those adaptations for those specific stimuluses that those professionals are going to give you and prescribe. And then you'll be able to do the things that you're limited by with more ease. That's kind of the, the concept of why this applies to everybody. Because everyone has limitations in life and you don't have to be an avid gym goer or be an athlete or, you know, any of those kinds of things. Like you have to be able to move and be a functional human. And that's why these things are integral to your quality of life as a, as a human being. So I think that's why this is such a strong topic to talk about and just really make like very understandable to anybody because it is really complicated and like so, there's a lot of science behind it obviously for why it all works the way it does and why there's certain numbers and standards but the main point is you need to know where to start and if you don't know where to start we're here to help you and obviously there's a lot of people out there that can help help you and then also guide you through the process so you're educated enough to do it on your own yeah very well said and i think i, I thought three points one is there might be two types of individuals that are listening. 
from a, a, a movement exercise fitness standpoint. One is I'm very specific. I am exercising. I want to exercise more. I want to exercise different. I want to exercise better because I'm training for a, a weightlifting competition. I'm training for a 5K. I'm training for something specific. And then you might have others that just say, you know, I'm just tired of getting tired of just walking up the stairs. I'm tired of not being able to bend over one or two, I'm tired of when I do bend over and I try and pick up my kids or I pick up the groceries from the back of the car, I'm exhausted and I can only carry one bag or things like that. You, you don't have anything specific that you're training for. You're just training for life. You just want to have a better quality of life. The other thing that I like that you talked about and it makes me think of is why a coach and why, you know, you might want to seek out someone else is whatever you're currently doing. If you're not where you want to be, you know, Les Brown always says you can always better your best wherever you are that you couldn't, you can't change that, but you can't, your circumstances do not determine, you know, where you can go. They merely determine where you start. So no matter where you are on that spectrum of health or fitness, the idea is our general concept and the message we're sending today is the same message. What we're then going to do, and this gets to my third point that I was thinking of, is whether you are a renal dialysis patient, you're, you know, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, you know, obese, type 2 diabetes, or you're, you know, training for uh, the Boston Marathon. Regardless of those two extremes, the said principle specific adaptation to impose demands is going to hold true for both. One of my fam favorite professors, um, Dr. Advis at Rutgers, he always said, learn the concepts and you can deduce the details. And it's like, what are the concepts? Well, the concepts are the slide we just showed you. The concepts are physical activity. The concepts are exercise. And what we're going to dive into are some tips and tricks and things like that. But we're going to dive into the specific types of exercise, cardio versus weights versus flexibility. But when you have those concepts, if I want to apply it to, you know, the office worker who's working, you know, uh, an extra two jobs, a night job, and is out of shape, overweight, taking diabetes medication, or the elite marathoner, the basic principles of prescription are going to be the same. The said principle just then gets into, well, we're going to prescribe different because we're going to prescribe relative to your current fitness state. We're going to prescribe relative to your mental, you know, state about exercise. We're going to prescribe based on your, you know, socioeconomic status, your environment, the equipment that you have. Maybe you don't have access to equipment. Maybe you do have access to the greatest gym in the world and money's not an issue. The principles of understanding health, understanding fitness, understanding exercise prescription the fundamental concepts are not going to be different. So those are three things that I thought of based on everything that you said, that it doesn't matter who you are. Everything we're saying is going to apply to you. So we can then tease in. This is where I, I'm, I'm very excited to get into. Let, let's break apart. We say exercise. Or we just sort of define the general concept of what exercise is. Are you ready to get into, Tyler? teasing out what we'll call the five health related physical fitness components. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this is near and dear to my heart just because I literally teach this in every class that I have, you know, when I'm teaching at, you know, the university and when I have open house, when I'm doing presentations or I'm doing workshops for schools, for, for sports teams, working with one-on-one -on -one with clients, I can put up this one slide that I'm going to show in a second. And I always say, I can explain the entire four year field, four year degree of exercise physiology from just this one slide. Just, I've been studying it for, you know, so many years, like 15 years, I can put this one slide up and then divert from these five health related physical fitness components and get into the entire field of exercise physiology, health, fitness, et cetera, regardless of where you want to go, regardless of what you want to do, I can pull it all back to just that slide we showed and now getting into this one specific slide. So here we go. 
So this is an awesome slide. I just found there's different ways of saying it, but this kind of gives you the definition. But I put it on almost every exam. I ask the students all the time. And, and at the end of a lot of my talks, it's, hey, if you're asking me to come in and teach you about nutrition and fitness, I want you to know the difference and what the five components of, we call the, the five health-related physical fitness fitness components. So they say components of fitness for health, but we call them the five health-related physical fitness components. You have cardiorespiratory endurance. Most people will just call this cardio or endurance. You have muscular strength, and then you can jump one extra muscular endurance. We separate those two, and Tyler and I are going to talk about why those are separated out, different examples. And then you have flexibility, and then you have body composition. So we have those five. So one of the things that we want to get into are, hey, cardiorespiratory fitness. Why do we prescribe, Tyler? Why, when you get into the associations and things like that, there's so much talk about cardiorespiratory fitness. Someone's VO2 max, aerobic capacity, which is just the maximal amount of oxygen that your body can take in, transport, uptake, and then use at the site of the muscle. So if we put you on a treadmill, to go from one mile an hour to two, to three, to four, to five, we use tons of different protocols, but you keep increasing the intensity. As the intensity goes up, you're gonna use more and more oxygen because the workload is gonna demand more and more energy and you're gonna need more and more oxygen in order to be able to do all of that stuff. So that the maximal amount of oxygen that your body can use is your VO2 max, aerobic capacity, you know, general. So we wanna know that number and there's plenty of places to go and get it tested out. You can reach out to us afterwards. There's field tests. You don't need to go and put a fancy mask on. There's formulas that you can do if you just go out and run a mile. There's tests that we'll do where you just have a step and we measure the step and we have you just continually go on the step and you don't even have to max out. We can look at your heart rate at that lower level and we can predict what your max is. But the reason we wanna know cardiorespiratory fitness is because it's extremely powerful. So it's the number one predictor of all cause mortality, more than hypertension, more than smoking, more than obesity, more than you know, hyperlipidemia. If we just know what your fitness level is, there's a ton of data and, and I can pull up a slide in a second that shows just that one value is more important to know than whether you are a smoker, whether you have hypertension, whether you're obese, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemic, um, you know, diabetic, things like that. Your fitness level can override all of those to a certain degree from a predictive standpoint. It's the most important variable that we know from all cause mortality. So we want to improve it. So what's one thing, you know, Tyler, that you always hear of someone who might be listening, who's really into lifting weights and things like that? Well, I think to what you were just making about the point of why cardiorespiratory fitness is like the one marker that we look at is because I wanted to mention this before too. With exercise, it's it's simple. We all know that we need to exercise, but it doesn't feel good when you exercise, right? Whatever it may be, you're putting stress on your body, your, your systems have to adapt. Again, like we were talking about before uh, we recorded micro tearing in the muscle, the bone is actually breaking down and remodeling, right? So these things aren't comfortable, but the you're doing it to know that it's going to pay off in the future. So it's like you're investing in yourself for that return on investment for again, those systems are more enhanced and your your equilibrium threshold is widened, right? For the stress that you're going to incur in life. So cardiorespiratory fitness, my point is, is that the higher cardiorespiratory fitness you have would be saying that those systems are going to be more efficient because they've been put under more stress and their thresholds have been increased. So that's why Patrick was saying before that, you know, your different biomarkers that we're going to look at are going to be within normal limits or even better than, you know, within a normalized data set and, and, and where they should be in terms of your blood pressure will be regulated, your blood lipids, your blood glucose, so on and so forth. The systems being able to be used for, um, for 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 sprinting or for for lifting weight for all you know muscular strength and your force production and your muscular endurance and your your heart being able to pump blood flow like all those systems are going to be optimized through the stress in which you put them under in exercise right structured exercise 
and that's going to increase your cardiorespiratory fitness and then going to reduce your risk for all cause mortality, which is basically like diseases and different things that could lead to death, right? So that's the reason why these things are so important. So to kind of tie that into why cardiorespiratory fitness is what we look at and why that's the leading cause of uh, reduction in basically death, right? The, the, the marker that we would look at and judge individuals on their fitness level. So what do I think of like people in the gym? Um, back to your point, you were saying, uh, I think a lot of people start out with wanting to just look better, like aesthetic wise. And that, that's kind of why a lot of, or pe- a lot of people get into working out for, for sports, which is great too, for having a goal to just be better at, you know, athletics or, uh, again, be in better shape or, uh, and be more attractive. I think though, knowing the reason why exercising to get you to start exercising is very important, but also remembering that the reason why you're continuing to exercise over your lifetime and why we say it applies to all ages is because of the point that I just made that Mm -hmm. your longevity and ability to reduce your risk of developing a disease that is, and we can talk about risk factors too here, modifiable modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, but your modifiable risk factors, the things that you actually have control over, which Patrick will get into, through exercising are going to be optimized versus the things that you can't control. Right. So obviously like, um, age, gender, genetics, right. Exactly. All those kinds of things that like are out of your control. So I think the reason to, to start doing this is should be first and foremost for your health. And then what secondary reasons do you want to exercise for? Is it for your, like we were talking about before quality of life? Is it for a weightlifting me? Is it for a ultra marathon? Is it for playing with your grandkids or being more, um, is, is it, is it also for your job to be more comfortable and not as agonizing if you have to lift things all day long, or if you're on your feet, right? Do you, do you want your feet to not hurt? There's, there's so many different reasons for why you may start. Yeah. And that's so powerful because shame on me, you know, cause whenever I teach or give seminars and things like that, it's, Hey, when a client comes to you, what's the first thing that you should start with? And it's first introduce yourself, obviously, but then it's, what are your goals? Like, what, what do you want to get out of your time with me? And Simon Sinek has his book, Start With Why, you know, the golden circle. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, you know, from like a company standpoint, things like that. So the idea would be then, and these are other podcasts that we've talked about and then other ones that we're planning where you want to have that goal in mind. But part of that reason could be, like you just said, you're training for something specific or you just, hey, this type two diabetes runs in my family. And I don't want to, you know, the number one cause of blindness and amputation in this country is hyperglycemic, like too high blood glucose for too long. And you're going to kill off the nerve endings and they're going to cut off your feet and they're going to cut off your toes and your fingers and stuff like that. Like That's a real thing. You can go blind. So maybe it's just that maybe you just don't want to follow that path. And that's been your genetic profile uh, handed down for generations. You, you do have some say in that so find that why of what you want to do and it makes me think of it's one of my favorite lines is from christopher mcdougall's uh, natural born heroes and he said be fit to be useful you know and and that's my mindset has changed now that i'm in my 40s from my 20s my 20s was i want to set every record i can possibly get my hands on i want to beat everyone i want to i still am extremely competitive individual ask my students and anyone like that but my mindset has shifted to my goal is I want to be more useful in life, but I also want to, you know, be able to do different things and live a long, healthy life. So it's a fantastic point to say, you first want to know why you're doing this. Like, why is it so important? Because cardiorespiratory, which is, you know, when we say cardiorespiratory, it's your cardiovascular system. And then it's respiratory, your respiratory system. So breathing in and out and in that air is oxygen and we breathe that oxygen in and then improving our cardiovascular system allows us to then bring more air, bring more oxygen in from the, each breath, transport it to our muscles. And then by enhancing our muscles, mitochondria, enzymes, transporters, all these fancy things, you can now use more of that oxygen. So that cardiorespiratory fitness is cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and then the the fitness of the site of the muscle. So we want to do that and we want to prescribe 
And this is what we're going to do in part two. We're going to break down all the specific details of different tests that you can do. And then, hey, where would you want to start when it comes to prescription? So, but this cardiorespiratory is, you know, once you get over like three minutes, if for the general individual, once you're more than like three minutes long and for general prescription, we're going to say, hey, can you get like five minutes, 10 minutes at a minimum for whatever bout of structured exercise or physical activity that you're going to do, that's going to primarily work on your cardiorespiratory system. So we say that endurance, and that's going to work a lot on that. It's super powerful because it's so potent and you just have to meet those minimum recommendations, you know, 30 minutes a day of moderate intensity, five days a week, 150 minutes. And notice those recommendations, we're going to dive into them in part two, they say moderate intensity. And there's another one which we'll get to in part two that can say, oh, you don't have enough time, you can do vigorous. But what we said before is you, if you're just standing around all day, maybe you're working you know, uh, shift work and you're just on your feet walking around or you might pick up a random box, you're not crossing that threshold or you're not crossing that threshold for long enough. And that's where maybe before we get into like the muscular fitness, some of the other components, we can start talking about the, the fit principle. Tyler? Yeah. And that's I think that's a lot I more just... in, 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 in episode two, we'll like really dive into those. Yeah. I think that makes a good point. I was just thinking of an analogy of like, you're having somebody meet standards, right? And like, okay. Cause I, I mean, we do have people that are super active, so they're probably going to meet like that. Um, like the moderate and then vigorous categories. But the thing is, is that there's people like they come in for me because of being a physical therapist, they have low back pain and it's like, okay, well, by doing your job and meeting the moderate and vigorous standards, that's great. And like, technically you're doing enough, right? But are you doing, maybe. right, maybe, quote unquote, but to, to meet, to meet the standards is great, right? But you want to, we all want to be better than just average, right? And the, just the standards, right? Those are just normalized data based on huge populations of people that we say that this is probably the best threshold for a majority of the population, yes. right? Everyone is different. That's the minimum, that is the, bare right. bones. And the other thing too, to say though, is, is that that's for most people, everyone's mm -hmm. different. So that may not fix the problem, right? And right. we were talking about before where now, unfortunately, and, and it's, and it is turning, I think it's, it's definitely getting better, but versus symptom management versus, uh, source management, right? So we have an issue, we're going to fix the issue. We're going to get rid of the symptoms versus, okay, we have an issue, but we have symptoms. All right. We're going to treat the symptoms. Your back hurts. All right. We're going to do some massage. We're going to do some stretching. We're going to do whatever, but you're doing all this stuff at work and it's causing it to, to hurt and reoccur and we're not actually fixing the problem. So that's something that's going to continue on and not be long-term fixable. That's when this, like Patrick was talking about before, the health-related components of fitness come in because to consider cardiovascular endurance, muscular endurance, strength, flexibility, body comp, and then breaking down, which we're going to get into, muscular strength, muscular endurance. We'll talk about power. We're going to talk about you know all the different kinds of each. Um, how each person is going to need something different, right? So someone might need to improve their strength. Someone might need to improve their endurance. Someone might need to improve their flexibility. Someone might need to improve their body composition. How many people do I have come in that have knee pain and they're obese? I mean, mm -hmm. if you just lost weight, your knee pain would be reduced significantly. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that if you meet the minimums and the standards that, are, that we're putting forward and saying, hey, you have to meet these at minimum, that's great, but there are specific things that are actually going to address your source of problem that you're having to make it not a long-term issue and not just treating the symptoms, not just taking a medication or just uh, setting a short-term goal and meeting it, but actually shifting your life in a better direction to, to have a higher quality of life like we were talking about before and be, be better than your current right self right so you're mm -hmm. the saying you're saying before you can always better your best right so that's that's the that's the whole point of this is that here are standards but also we need to understand what each different component means because each person is going to need a different component that they can improve we always talk about too to patients i have someone who's hyper flexible they have a ton of range of motion they were a ballet dancer they they have a lot of flexibility but they they 
that's great, but they actually lack stability, right? They have a lot of range of motion through the muscles. They can elongate and shorten through full range of motion, and they have a lot of motion in the joints, but that they're lacking stability in the joints. So they have too much motion and now they're actually having pain from having too much motion. So that kind of person is going to benefit from, from more stability and more controlled and strengthening exercise than someone who may be coming in who's very stiff and needs to work on more flexibility, right? And they need to work on more stretching and working on having the muscles adapt and improve their range through lengthening and shortening cycles. So the point is, is that everyone is different. And to understand the basics of each of these components is going to help you dive deeper into your source management and fixing the issue at hand and not just treating the symptoms and becoming more educated. Because when you're more educated, especially in physical therapy and in Patrick's profession and, and exercise and teaching people, we're trying to make people more independent. We don't want to make people have to rely on us forever. Our goal is to make you a more independent human being so you can go out and crush life and not have to rely on us. And we're always here as a source, obviously, as information. But to get off that uh, spiel, let's go yeah. back to what we were talking about before. Let's talk about, like you were saying, the muscular strength and, and different things and how they're different, muscular endurance. Yeah. No, and it's a, it's a great point that you mentioned, like, that, that you know, you, we want to enhance <clears throat> – education you, you want to know more about the things if you have a goal you want to know about the things that are going to be required to help get you to that goal and maybe that goal is i don't want to have low back pain you know and there's like that saying knowledge is power but better than knowledge is applied knowledge you know it doesn't matter what you know it matters what you do with what you know so we're providing all that knowledge and then we're also then going to try and provide again like that motivation, that drive, but those specific principles and systems to be able to put that knowledge into practice to improve whatever it is that you want to improve. So yeah, getting into muscular strength versus muscular endurance, you know, and I can pull up that slide again. Basically, when you look at muscular strength and muscular endurance, most people will just call, the, we lump those into muscular fitness. You know, and it's, oh, I just want to improve my muscular strength. And most people don't know about muscular endurance or they don't really talk about or think about muscular endurance. But when we get into like just a basic muscular strength, it's, well, our ability to exert force during an activity. It's essentially your one rep max, like how much weight, what's the maximal amount of force that you can generate like one time. And then we can get into the weeds of, well, maybe three times, five times, 10 times. But if you're picking up a, the heaviest weight you can pick up once, by default, if you can only pick it up once, if you want to be able to pick up a weight twice or three times, it has to be a lighter weight. So that weight or load and repetition are going to sort of be inversely related. The greater the weight that you want to pick up, the less number of reps times that you're going to be able to pick it up. So you have that muscular strength, and we can even expand that to like, let's say, 10 repetitions. You know, that's going to be like that tail end. But eventually, if you picked up a lighter weight, you know, if you picked up like a 10 pound dumbbell and or you just used your body weight, you started just body weight squatting down. Maybe some people can't do more than 10 reps. And for them, doing five, six reps is going to work on their strength. But for a lot of people listening, well, I can do way more body weight squats. I can do 100. It's like once you get to like 15, 20 reps of anything, now you're venturing away from improving your muscular strength, and now you're improving your muscular endurance. And we're not going to get into the weeds. If you really want to learn about all this stuff in great detail, hey, come and major in exercise physiology, and you can learn about it in a variety of different classes. Um, but you then get into muscular endurance, where the difference between the two is how much muscle are you recruiting? And we have energy pathways set up that you're recruiting energy differently. So when you get into muscular endurance, you know, somebody doing push-ups, you know, if you're going to do pick up groceries and you're going to have to carry them up four flights, you know, it's not muscular strength. You have to have an, enough muscular strength to pick up the grocery bags, but it's going to be muscular endurance that we touch on that, that health related physical fitness component of muscular endurance. that's going to allow you to bring her from the car up four flights of stairs. That's muscular endurance, being able to contract your biceps, stabilize your trunk and your core to do that up four flights of steps that might take, you know, a few minutes. 
there's going to be a cardiorespiratory aspect to that as well. That's going to allow you to do the like, you know, oxygen aerobic component of walking up and down the stairs, but to be able to hold your core shoulders, biceps, and hold those groceries and carry them that whole time, that's muscular endurance. It's muscular strength is, hey, can you pick up this giant boulder or this really, really, really heavy couch or thing that I need you to just pick up and shift? That's muscular strength. So we want to talk about the differences between the two. And at the end of the day, Everything Tyler and I keep saying is, you know, that that be fit to be useful, this functionality is what well, we want this wide range of the spectrum from, it's what we call them, health-related physical fitness components. We want to be able to do a lot of these different things. So we want to be able to touch on a lot of these different things. If you want to improve your the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand, if you want to be more cardiorespiratory fit, if you want to improve your, your cardio, you're going to do cardiorespiratory-based exercise. If you want to improve your muscular strength, you're not going to do cardio. If you go out and run five miles every day, that's not going to in increase the amount of weight that you can pick up, you know, for one or two reps. Likewise, if all you do is, you know, body weight squats, that's going to not really help you run a better marathon or 5K and things like that. It's going to improve you to a, a certain degree for those that are very, very fit, but it's not going to enhance those cardiorespiratory you know, systems. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So wh wh where do you want to, how do you want to tease apart like muscular strength, muscular endurance? We don't want to spend too much time on them. And I, we sort of gave examples, but from the understanding of like goals and why you might want to train one versus the other, or we can get into you know, depending on what access to equipment you have, there's going to be an overlap. So even an individual who doesn't have a ton of equipment, there's ways that we can adapt it. And that's where, again, you go to a coach, you go to a strength coach, you go, you know, if it's, if it's ailments and you have low back pain or things like that, a physical therapist, you know, a, a really good one like Tyler is not going to just want you to be pain free in your low back. They're going to want you to be pain free, but then they're going to set you up with a program that's going to allow you to then get stronger and stronger and stronger, more muscular endurance you know, all your trunk muscles on a general daily basis. If you're in a job and you're sitting at your desk for eight hours, you know, unless you're leaning back in your desk, well, those are muscular endurance. That's muscular endurance. Those muscles are continually firing to keep you upright and to not let your head fall over. That's muscular endurance. It's not strength. That strength is going to, is how much weight and force can you generate for just a couple reps, you know, for 10 seconds, for 15 seconds, things like that. So what, what, what thoughts are you having about well, this? I like that? I like that. Cause you can get, we can dive real deep on like fiber type of muscles sure. and how everyone has type one, type two fibers, type one being more endurance two being more fast twitch. So slow twitch for type one, type two being more fast twitch type one would be more like Patrick just said, longer sustained exercise, muscular endurance. And then your type two would be more fast twitch. I have to lift something quick up off the ground, or I have to run across the street real quick because a bus is coming and I'm crossing the street. So why am I saying that? Again, we're all human beings, right? If you're listening to this, you're a human being most likely. So you're going to have those kinds of muscle fibers. And that kind of makes a really good point of what Patrick was just saying is, is you're going to have to train both systems, muscular strength and muscular endurance, because they're both going to be needed in your everyday life at some point or another, right? We're not just going to be lifting heavy um, things up and putting them down constantly all day long, unless you're a bodybuilder or something like that, or you have, or you're a power lifter and that's all you're doing. And that's your full-time job. You know, then that on the flip side of that, your muscular endurance, you need to be able to walk them down the stairs. You need to be able to walk to your car. You need to be able to walk in and out of work, you need to be able to have a functioning level of muscular endurance to be able to do those kinds of things. And then also be able to do sustained repetitions, picking up the groceries, bringing them in. So there's some sort of strength component there, but over a sustained period of time, like Patrick just said. So I think the way to kind of tackle both of them is to say, hey, well, I need to train both of these systems, but which one do I need to work on more right now and optimize to a higher degree? But then at the same time, 
considering that I also need to, you know, have a higher level of aerobic fitness, like we talked about before, which is probably going to be more of that muscular endurance component of working out. So doing higher repetitions, like you said, probably above 12, right within that 15 to 20 rep range. So I think just keeping it simple and thinking of repetitions for like the beginner, uh, for muscular strength, like Patrick said, obviously your one rep max is probably truly the gold standard, but then maybe like a three rep max, a four to five to six, maybe all the way up to eight to 10, like Patrick was saying before, for more of a strength component. And I think the reason that we were going to make the point before we kind of alluded to about bone mineral density is, is that when you're doing weight bearing exercise, and that means when your feet are connected to the floor and you have a load and you're moving through full range of motion, that is going to be extremely advantageous to your bone. Because when you're actually loading your bone, your bone is breaking down and rebuilding stronger. So this is super crucial because Patrick and I were ch chatting about before, pretty much after 40 years old, all the things that we've talked about in this episode so far are gonna decline. So if you're not doing any of these things, before you're you hit 40 and and you're aging your systems are going to be declining and you're not, you're not maintaining your threshold like we we're talking about before so the goal is to improve your threshold so when you decline naturally with age you're obviously your quality of life still stays super high and then why do i want to keep my bone mineral density high someone might ask well we want to avoid issues with as we get older especially women as they go through menopause when they get older too naturally hormones are going to change and your systems in your body aren't going to be as optimized as they were when you were young and youthful. So you're going to be at an increased risk for, um, um, osteopenia. I was thinking of sarcopenia because I want to talk about that before, Yeah, but osteopenia Patrick was talking about, and he has in some of his slides too, which is going to, your bone mineral density is going to be decreased and there's going to be a threshold obviously to then get to something which probably more people have heard before is osteoporosis. And the issue with these are is, is that as we get older and we'll get into the skill related fitness components and why those are advantageous, your, your coordination, your reaction time, your force production, your balance, right? As you get older, I mean, how many people now, if you're another physical therapist listening to this, you know, balance as 65 and up, the increase of a risk of fall is very significant. And then on top of that, the increase of a fracture with a fall with having someone who has a lower bone mineral density being osteopenic is at much higher or even stress fractures too, which we probably don't think a whole lot about mm -hmm. as well with even younger, we can, I mean, we can talk about this. We could do a whole episode on this female athlete triad, right? Y younger females can are at a higher risk with, um, on the opposite end of the spectrum an increased risk for stress, stress fractures. And then also as you get older, because your bone mineral density is already naturally decreasing at an increase risk for that. And then if you're osteoporotic, if you're going to fall, you're, you're very likely to have a fracture. And when you have a fracture, I'll let Patrick talk about this, but the goal of doing what we're doing, providing you guys with all of these metrics to follow and, and, and to be really get onto a structured program to be able to maintain these systems and thresholds is to prevent your risk from, if you do have a fracture, then having some sort of disease that leads to death, right? We wanna live as long as possible. So if, you're, if you optimize these systems, if something like that does happen or it's more traumatic and you have a sports related injury or a fall when you're younger and it's not related to your bone mineral density per se, we wanna make sure that your ability to recover and adapt and get back onto baseline is optimized and is at the peak of where it could be for your success. Your prognosis, we call it right in the medical field, is optimized and is enhanced and is reduced, right? Your time of full recovery to return to your prior level of function is what we call it in physical therapy is going to be as efficient as possible. So what do you yeah. think about that? Oh, so I, I love you because you had us pivot and it's so great working with you because my, you know, my brain, my brain wants to go in a million different directions. I'm so passionate and I'm so excited about all this stuff. That's why I'm a college professor in this field. I give workshops and seminars and coach and stuff like that. But to get into sort of culminating the cardiorespiratory fitness, and then you have muscular strength, muscular endurance. We, we, Hey, all cause mortality, just cardiorespiratory. It's going to decrease your risk of dying of especially cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer, not only in the United States, but the entire world. But then you have all these other diseases and things like that. So it's, well, we want to do cardio for these specific reasons. It's going to reduce your risk of dying. It's going to help just over, improve your overall functionality because now you're just more fit cardiorespiratory wise and you can 
run faster, walk faster, bike faster, or at a certain pace for a longer period of time. So your activities of daily life, quality of life improved, but now you get into, okay, why do we want to, why do we want to lift weights? Like, why would I care about muscle mass? Why would I care about bone mass? And at the end of the day, this is where you then get into, okay, well, if someone is, and it doesn't matter what age, but especially when you get into like your twenties and thirties, we really want to focus on this prevention because you're like modeling your bone up until like the age of 30. And by that modeling the bone, it's, 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 it's really determining like once you reach, you know, puberty and things like that, the longitudinal epiphyseal plates, like your long bones are going to stop growing, close the plates and things like that. Now you're not going to get taller, but after that, you know, uh, puberty phase and you move into, you know, late teens, adulthood, it's not the length of your bones, but the longitudinal or no, the latitude, latitudinal, the thickening of your bones is what you can really work on. Yeah. So when we're getting into like osteoporosis, that bone, we're talking about longitudinal lengthening. So it's really that longitudinal thickness of the bone. We call that bone mineral density. The idea would be when you go to a, you know, if you're talking to a nurse, if you're talking to a doctor, you know, even a lot of nutritionists and like general registered dietitians, the first thing that they're going to tell you is, oh, you have osteopenia, which is a precursor to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a clinically diagnosed you know, disease of the bone because you have bone mineral density. Your bone mineral density is the, the, the thickness inside the bone, your spongy bone and things like that. And you're like two and a half standard deviations away from like the normal average bone. Osteopenia is a precursor, but they're going to recommend vitamin D and calcium. Well, calcium, calcified bone and things like that, but that vitamin D is going to help you, you know, absorb more calcium. So that's why we say take more vitamin D and calcium. And that's going to help. Because you need that if you want to lay down and remodel more and more bone and make it thicker. But that's only going to take you so far. That's where you get into the PT world, the strength and conditioning world, you know, things like that, even the athletic training world, where it's not just calcium and vitamin D, but you have to apply load against the bone. You have to tell the bone, bone, I want you to grow thicker. Because if you throw vitamin D and calcium, the, the bone's just going to, whatever it's currently doing, it's just going to use that in whatever it's doing, so long as there's enough. And if you're deficient, yes, that's going to help. But that's not going to tell your bone to get thicker. It's not going to significantly increase your bone mineral density. You have something known as Wolf's Law, which has to deal with, you know, sort of a, a reciprocal, um, like a, a reciprocal response. So the more load you apply to the bone, the more the bone is going to be overloaded. And the more the bone is going to want to reciprocate and adapt by getting more and more dense so that when you continually apply more and more load, the bone is now thicker and thicker and thicker to be able to withstand a heavier load than the ones that you've been applying against it. So that, that's like a big point to bring up. And when we got into a minute ago, hey, we do cardio for certain reasons. Cardio is going to help, especially if it's load bearing. But you then get into, well, you're, unless you're wearing like a, a weighted vest or like a ruck march or something like that, it's only going to help so much. That's where weightlifting is like, you know, reigns supreme, superior at promoting an increase in bone mineral density, because it's going to just allow you to apply more and more loads against the bone. So like your, your long bones, you know, let's say your femur, you know, that compressive apply the load and it's going to compress against the bone and then the bone's going to want to respond by adapting to get thicker and thicker you do need more of that calcium and vitamin d but you got to tell the bone why it should want to get thicker and overload it so it can adapt to be more and that's where with the weight training you have hey if someone had osteoporosis and we want to, or just in general we want to improve our bone mineral density when you get an osteoporosis, that's where, you know, Tyler's world and you're working with special populations. Hey, we want to limit you from like spinal twisting. We don't want you to do like very high impact ballistics type, type box drops and things like that. So we want to do more slow movements, but we still going to want to load the bone. The idea would be we want to improve that bone through resistance training. And then at the same time, Tyler mentioned sarcopenia and muscle wasting and things like that. And once you hit like 40 years old, 
you're just starting to degrade your bone. It just doesn't remodel as much. That's where vitamin D and calcium can only help so much. Same thing with your muscles. They're just going to slowly degrade because your whole body is being broken down and repaired on a daily basis. So we want weights in order to elicit, you know, increases in the muscle tissue itself, skeletal muscle. So the wasting away of skeletal muscle over time is going to be labeled as sarcopenia. So that happens very significantly once you hit around the age of 40. So we want to lift weights to improve bone mineral density and reduction in the wasting away of the muscle and to prolong that or to put on more muscle or to thicken the bone. So we have all these benefits. So we're going to paint this wonderful picture of what's your goal? What do you hear for me specifically? But then even if you didn't say it, I'm still going to, in the back of my mind, be thinking, well, here's reasons why you want to pay attention to your cardiorespiratory if you're only focused on weights. Or here's why you want to focus on some weights if you're only focused on cardiorespiratory. You know, you are a complete person. There's multiple aspects to you and you can die of many things. And even if you're not going to die of it, it can significantly decrease your quality of life and your functionality and the activities of daily life in your personal life, in your professional life, you know, at work and things like that. So we, th those are sort of the big three of cardiorespiratory. You're just more fit in general. Like that's the general term when we use fitness. You, you, you just have a greater endurance to be able to use more oxygen, last a lot longer if you're going upstairs, if you're, you know, running, biking, swimming, playing, whatever, basketball. You then get into the muscular fitness, muscular strength, pick up heavier objects. That's going to apply more load against your bone, improve your overall bone mineral density, build you more muscle and certain muscle types. We won't get into that today. You know, muscular endurance, similar concept. It's just submaximal load that allows you to do and carry that weight or do more and more repetitions. So those are the big three and sort of reasons why. And then we can just touch on the flexibility, body composition a little bit. We can do a whole uh, show on just body composition. We can do a whole show on all of these, but you know, body composition is sort of in its own world, but it's related to health. And that's why it's part of those five health-related physical fitness components, because it's part of your muscle mass. And maybe we'll go into body comp. You know, your, your breakdown, two-compartmental model, your muscle mass, your lean body mass, and then your fat mass. Or sometimes you can say fat mass and your fat-free mass. So it's like, well, your fat mass is your fat, your stored fat, and then your fat-free mass is everything else, your muscle, your bone, your blood, et cetera. So we want to jump into, let's, let's do body composition, then we can do flexibility, and then we'll just end it with just touching on the skill-related physical fitness components. Yeah, I think a good point to mention too, it's something I actually learned from you first before I heard it more through other clinicians and um, you know doctors and things like that and people that I've listened to in the field, but um, gynoid and android obesity. So thinking like an apple and a pear, right? And why, so why are we even, I always like to think of like, why, why is body composition important? And those are two of the reasons, right? So if you have more of that Android, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, but Android, around Apple, the think a, Apple, Apple, right? And around the abdomen, right? Is something that is usually more related to metabolic syndrome. And we could probably do a whole podcast on that as well. Those are, if you're interested, just specific criteria that will basically put you at a higher risk for what we keep talking about, all cause mortality, which is death, right? Disease and, and death related illnesses. Um, so why is that a problem well when you have a lot of fat around your organs the visceral components right that's going to reduce their ability to work effectively and expand and contract and also put them at a higher risk for like we talked about before uh lipids increased lipids increased cholesterol in the bloodstream at a higher risk for cerebrovascular issues like stroke so on and so forth so we want to avoid having extra fat in the abdomen because of organs not being able to function properly, a lot of pressure around the heart and the, and the lungs, they can't expand and contract as they need to, their muscle, muscle tissues. And um, 
ideally we'll have it more in the hips. So that'd be more of that gynoid or that pear shape, right? That's safer to have it in the hips and in the gluteal region and in the buttock than to have it around the belly. So that is kind of why very generally and keeping it surface level to understand and not being too in the weeds with it, why body composition is something that we look at. Also like Patrick talked about before, but body composition that's just kind of a street term for like cardiorespiratory fitness. There's so many different things that body composition, those are two of the things that it has in it, but also like we were just talking about before, body composition, you can even argue probably biomarkers are gonna play into that. So your blood glucose is probably going to be better, right? Your insulin sensitivity is going to be better regulated with a better body composition. Your cholesterol pro profile and triglyceride, like the, the fat in your blood, and the, the, the vessels and the arteries and moving fluid and blood flow around and allowing the heart and the, the lungs to work efficiently, is it gonna have less restriction in the piping of your body with less cholesterol and less fat in there, the lipids, right? If they're optimized and they're better. So with, with those things just generally saying are going to relate to your body composition. And if you have a better body composition, lower body fat, increased muscle mass, like Patrick was talking about before, those are going to make sure that those different uh, criteria that we just mentioned are, are in a better normalized pool and, and you're at a reduced risk of disease for the reasons that we just mentioned. Yeah. And you've got, yeah. So the, the Android, so you think apple, apple shaped and that you're carrying all of your visceral organs, the viscera are like in your, you know, like midsection. So when you store a lot of body fat around those, they call that visceral fat. That's like the really, really bad fat. When you carry fat, you know, like in your arms, when you carry fat, more of that gynoid, it's like pear shaped, you know, you'll carry more of that fat, like Tyler said, you know, in, in the glute region, like your butt, your hips, your thighs, stuff like that. That's more subcutaneous fat, fat found directly underneath the skin, the surface of the skin. That fat is not as much of a disadvantage from all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, less of an inflammatory state. It's the visceral fat that's really bad. One of the simple ways of thinking of it would be if you took your organs and if your organs needed to work and by working, they have nutrients and byproducts going into and out of it. If you wrapped a lot of fat around that, that impedes the flow of the good things coming in and the bad things going out. So it just decreases the efficiency that can lead to inflammation. It can lead to a variety of different things related to cardiovascular disease, you know, higher blood sugar, hyperglycemia, type two diabetes, higher blood pressure, all these different things. Cause the body is not going to work as well. Now the heart is going to have to work harder to pump the blood because your tissues aren't getting the, the nutrients that they need. And they're sending the brain, all these different things. So we want to work on not getting those. And the other aspect that you, touched on that made me then think of, oh, why is body composition in the list of five health-related physical fitness components? And it's, well, we just talked about muscular fitness, endurance, and strength. Well, if you want to improve your muscle mass, we're going to use muscular strength and to a degree muscular endurance. Well, muscle mass is one of the two components of a two-compartmental model of body composition. So it just plays hand in hand. And then from a health standpoint, you know, it's from a a, you know, a body fat, you know, as we store fat and things like that, that's going to play a big role into our overall health. So yeah, like you said, we're not going to get into the weeds. There's different ways. And we can even talk about this in part two, because we'll talk a lot about testing. How do we test all these things? And then what do we do with that information once we test them? So we'll lay that out very well in part two, because there's different ways. You don't need fancy equipment. You know, I've got like a $50,000 um, body composition, the bod pod in, in my lab, you can just take a general tape measure, you know, and just measure your waist circumference. You know, you can look at waist to hip ratio. If somebody just said, Hey, how do I know if I have like too much body fat, we can get into BMI and the pros and cons of BMI, you know, it doesn't account for muscle mass and things like that. But the reason that might not be great for BMI is because that doesn't tell you where the fat is. The number one Easiest, simplest way to find out if someone has good or bad body composition from a body fat standpoint, maybe someone has more fat than person A and person B. Maybe they have the same amount of fat, but person A carries it in their hips and person B carries it in their midsection. So that midsection also includes like your belly. One of the questions would be, hey, what pant size do you wear? 
you know, and if you wear based on your general height, if you wear, if like, if I wore a size 40 jean or suit pants, Hey, that's a big indicator that I've got a very large belly. Belly fat is visceral fat. That's really bad. So it's like an easy way of just estimating it and things like that. You can look at like waist to hip ratio and just use a basic tape measure. But we'll get into that in, in part two. Anything else you wanted to mention uh, about body comp? No, I think that's really good. I mean, that talks, we, we can have like a whole, if people are interested in that, we can have a whole discussion on diving deeper into that and different ways to measure it and different ways to kind of see where you're at. And, and again, if you need to be referred to a physician, you know, go see your doctor and things just to have people have a little more control over their life and know where their baseline is. Yeah. So and then last, good... last point before we get into flexibility is I wanted to touch on the reason why before I said cardiorespiratory fitness, knowing your fitness level is more predictive of all cause mortality than and I gave a bunch of examples, smoking, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, um, so blood glucose, as well as obesity. You have individuals who you've heard the term fat, but fit, you know, it can be an individual who's carrying extra body fat, but they do a lot of exercise. And that gets into this idea of, well, exercise alone, isn't going to be the only component that's going to help you reduce your body fat and things like that. But that's a separate talk. The idea would be that fat but fit is someone's carrying excess body fat, but they're doing all this exercise to improve their cardiorespiratory fitness. And we just said, well, if I had to pick one, hopefully you're picking both and you're improving both. But that cardiorespiratory fitness is so powerful. And most of what we talk about is it's so powerful at reducing cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality. Why do we care about that? Because like we already said, it kills more people than anything else. So that's the lower hanging fruit. These are lifestyle related diseases that we're talking about. So the idea is you have that fat but fit, but you then have individuals who will look at themselves and they don't exercise at all, but they're what we call skinny fat, where it's like, oh, you look like you're totally healthy, but inside you don't have any subcutaneous fat. So we don't have any fat that really shows. And that's the benign fat. It's not really bad but you then have visceral fat. So they call that the skinny fat. You look totally fine, but you've got a ton of fat being stored. You know, you get into like fatty liver disease and stuff like that. You have a ton of fat stored in and around your organs, even though you can't see it from the outside. You know, so you then get into more advanced assessments and you have, that's where you would go and look at a different amount of the certain technology and certain body composition analyzers that will break down how much subcutaneous fat and how much visceral fat you have and things like that. So we can even put like in the show notes and stuff like that. So like some list of here's different, you know, like a, a an in-body, uh, you know, bioelectrical impedance that's going to give you like trunk and arms and it's going to break down things like that. We can put some of that in the show notes, but um, so body composition, all good flexibility. So the last of the five health related physical fitness components, but I don't want to keep people for too long. I know you and I can talk about this for hours and hours and we have, but for the sake of brevity, which is not my strong suit, let's, um, let's move on flexibility. So th this is probably a, a big part of your world. I'm personally attesting to, I should have stretched more when I was younger, but I definitely should be stretching more now that I'm in my forties. And if you read David Goggins, you're in the process of reading it now. I've read it like three times. Can't hurt me. Towards the tail end, he's going to talk about stretching and how, how he, his body, he became like almost incapacitated and it was stretching. He stretches like hours a day. But from a general flexibility standpoint, it's one of the five health-related physical fitness components. You probably address it a lot more in your day-to-day -day life from your actual profession. So I'll let you maybe sort of take it away on why we care about flexibility. Yeah, for sure. And to go back to your point of that, you wish you did it more. I think I'm falling into that category now as well of being very sedentary in graduate school. And as you, we've attested in other episodes, when you need to do PhD work, the same kind of thing of just studying constantly and being in a sitting position or standing position for a prolonged period of time. But I think I like to talk about both like stretch, uh, stretching flexibility, and then also mobility, because I think they're both super important. And I think you can have, like we've talked about before, um, with mobility and stability component, but you can have like 
one of the two being very good and, and the other one lacking. So, you know, you could have someone who's, who's pretty mobile and has, you know, let's just use like a weightlifter who has to throw a barbell over their head and has to have very good overhead mobility, which a lot of people struggle with because we're sitting a lot nowadays. We're in the car, we're at work, we're bent over. You got that kyphotic bent over yeah. posture. Yep. Right? You very we're rarely limited. put your hands up. So it's exactly. like, well, I mean, how many times a day do we put our hands over our head even to reach up for a high, you know, shelf to lift something or, you know that that kind of thing or at work probably very very slim unless you're in construction or something where you're lifting or working or hammering things or an electrical worker or something like that but um so you know i think the the reason that it's important so mobility was is more joint specific we don't have that on here but they kind of play into one another i think on one of your slides it had them as like a it had a slash with the bull flexibility and mobility but Flexibility being able to, as we talked about before, the muscles allowing them to ex expand over their full range of motion and in increasing that range of motion. Everyone's range of motion is going to be different. We could also have do a whole episode on this too, but with your nervous system and the different stretch receptors and 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 mechanisms that you have, so you don't overstretch a muscle and tear it, right? So to be able to kind of allow those systems to be more efficient and allow you to improve your range of motion through prolonged stretching. There's also so many different kinds of stretching. We can talk about dynamic, yeah. static, yeah. ballistic, yeah. Like, yeah. and they, I'm sure you teach that all the time. That's something I learned from you too. And I did my under undergrad work, but um, yeah, flexibility is super important because it's going to allow you to move through full range of motion and allow you to then that kind of tags onto mobility. When you're moving through full range of motion, you're allowing that joint the bone on bone structure to articulate and move through it, all of its, we called in school, um, degrees of freedom. So the ability for it to kind of move in all of the different directions that the joint permits will really be, it's gonna, they're gonna play off one another. So the more flexibility, the more length and shortening you have in a muscle is gonna allow that joint to articulate and move within its structure more. So, so this is something that, and we can make recommendations too when we do our prescription testing prescription uh, series, but or episode of how to warm up, like doing more dynamic stuff. I know traditionally when I first started working out before I was educated, I used to do prolonged stretching, static stretching before all my workouts. And if you look at the research, it, it's only calling for dynamic to decrease um, limits in muscle performance. Because if you're if you're stretching for a prolonged period of time before you work out. To some degree, you're taking away the stiffness in the muscle. And we can talk about that in terms of, again, stiffness is going to be relative to probably more like powerlifters and strength athletes. You want some degree of stiffness in the muscle to be able to resist force. So if you're, you know, stretching the muscle and, and getting it to its full, you know, length and position, when you're going through whatever you're doing, you're going to, you're going to decrease some of that stiffness and decrease some of like rigidity, so, so to speak, in the, the exercise that you're doing and, and reduce some of your strength. So subsequently decreasing your performance, that's kind of what we're seeing when we're having people statically stretch before they work out versus doing dynamic, meaning moving. So you would just a quick tidbit to add in, which is again, kind of like a precursor to our prescription testing prescription episode that we're going to do doing active warmups, right? Is a, is a general way of saying it or dynamic stretching before you exercise is better and doing static and prolonged stretching after you exercise. And that's something that I don't do really well with right now. I think that's also why I've been struggling so much with my flexibility is this finishing my workout. All right, pack my stuff up and leave and not do like a cool down, right? Like a, like a bringing your heart rate down. If you just go for a run, you're walking at like a speed walk or, you know, a normal gait speed and, and trying to bring that heart rate down from being at a higher threshold. It's the same kind of thing with your muscles. If you do a workout, and you're, you're shortening them and lengthening them, you want to allow them to then kind of try and cool down and take them through their full end range and then shortening and try and have some sort of a cool down and prolonged stretching period. So that's kind of flexibility and then mobility. And we can get into, I'm big on mobility, controlled articulated rotations is a big thing that I prescribe with a lot of my patients. Really, that's just a fancy way for saying, taking the joint, like I said, was saying before, through its full range of motion and all the degrees of freedom that it permits. And allowing you to explore in both aspects flexibility and mobility but mobility more specifically uh per, to to explore the the ability of range that you have in that joint and you can improve that it's the same thing with flexibility if you're limited in a certain and we have different measures that we can do like you know we can do hamstring length we can do quadricep length we can measure these things kind of see where you're at baseline and then 
over prescription of, of static stretching, prolonged stretching, improve that same thing with mobility. If you are, and I think Patrick mentioned this before, I don't remember if we were recording or not, but just doing a couple arms, arm circles, you know, real quick, you know, one time a day or maybe one time a week, that's, you're not going to improve your mobility through that joint. It has to be something that's structured and repetitive and, and isolating the joints and taking them through their, their different motions to really improve the mobility in that joint. So I think, I think flexibility is very important and it's something that's going to help you reduce your musculoskeletal issues and also injuries, traumatic injuries. And as we get older to just in, increase your quality of life, if you can bend over when you're 65, 70 years old and, bend, and tie your shoes, right? I mean, that's going to be pretty advantageous versus you having to, you know, put a barbell over your head when you're a 25 year old Olympic weightlifting athlete. So again, it's salient to the individual and like all these things are here, like you were making the point before, because over your lifespan, they're always going to apply to you. They're not, it's not like one of these is going to fall off and you're only going to have to focus on four. Like you're always going to have to focus on one to five of the health related fitness components through your lifespan. Yeah, no. So there's a ton. Uh, and if my former advisor, Dr. Arndt, Dr. Sean Arndt and colleague and now friend is listening. I'm, he, I'm, he's sitting on me for years. I need to write, finish writing up. We did a static versus dynamic stretching study back at Rutgers. It's like I graduated in 2013. So I'm like sitting on this data for 10 years and we use the soccer players, male and female. And we showed that static stretching is going to primarily, it's not even strength as much as power because it's, it's by stretching and holding the muscle, if there's any athletes that are lifting, the idea is if you're doing anything that's very explosive, if you stretch and hold you know, the shoulder, there's something known as muscle spindles in there, which have like a stretch reflex. So like you know, someone who's a baseball pitcher, they're coming back and then they're gonna want to come back and that's gonna load it and it's gonna tell the muscle spindle to fire and it's gonna help you throw more powerfully. By statically stretching, it's going to decrease and downregulate those muscle spindles, and that's going to decrease your overall power output. So we did vertical jump. We used a, a biodex, um, a, you know, like a, a, a isokinetic dynamometer and things like that to put them through. It generally, especially if you're doing anything and you don't want to decrease strength, especially power, don't do static stretching right before. And static stretching is stretch and hold. The dynamic stretching would be, you know, if you do um, like, you know, just a, a standing forward bend and holding it, that's static stretching. You know, you can like raise your hands and then go and touch your toes and raise your hands. That's dynamic. You're not pausing and down regulating the powerful muscle spindles and things like that. But you th then, so that's just one and this idea of proper warm up. And you got into flexibility, mobility, and then I think of stability. I think you mentioned stability as well. So like how stable are you? And that starts to venture into, we're not going to really get into today just for the, the, the sake of time, the skill related, but that's starting to get into. You have the five health related physical fitness components. We just talked about them, cardiorespiratory, muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, body composition. They have always talked about adding a sixth. And that sixth is known as neuromotor exercise, like neuromotor fitness, yoga, Tai Chi, kind of everything you're just talking about. It's it, they're all tied together, but it would be that flexibility, but now you're holding an object and uh, what's the, what's it's, it's, it's like, if you look at Tai Chi, it's, it's fluid neuromotor is neuromuscular. It's your brain recruiting your skeletal muscle fibers to contract in a very coordinated and you know fluid motion what's the new i mean kettlebell is kind of like that but what's the new one it's like these crazy clubs oh yeah God. yeah and it's i don't know the name of the the technical but it's, term but it's yeah. like you know from like ancient rome or ancient greece or something but it's got this heavy weighted head on the end of like a heavy club and they're just sitting there and they're just swinging it around around and around in that different areas. And it's like, that's like a pendulum. And once it goes, it's like, you got to activate a lot. But the idea of being able to do that very fluid is like neuromuscular recruitment, but in a very, you know, fluid, stable, you know, pattern, but having increased flexibility, I think of flexibility and you have warm up flexibility, you know, whatever you're doing in a general day, 
and there's tons of different differing schools of thought on injury risk and flexibility and stuff like that. But I just think of overall functionality. It's, you know, if, if I put you in a straight jacket, you're not very functional. And the main reason you're not functional is because we've taken away your flexibility. So if you become more flexible, well, now you can potentially reach more things. Like you are more useful in your own world by being more flexible. So uh, flexibility is huge. It's something that I think of, out of all of the health related physical, it's probably the one that gets the least, the most neglect. And, you know, uh, Jim Rohn, my favorite speaker, he always talks about this idea that one neglect, you know, leads to another, you know, and before you know it, that neglect can turn into a disease, things like that. So I think flexibility is a big one that people don't give enough credit. So those are the five health related physical fitness components. Anything you want to add about them? No, I think those things you're talking about are Indian clubs. So people are interested. Indian clubs. Yeah. 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 So uh, they make different weighted ones. They make different lengths, but yeah, no, I think that's, they're great. I, I haven't seen a lot of use just in my setting because it's more hospital based, but I, I do know a friend of mine, Joe, actually that we had on at Iron Health, he uses them. So he'll have them at his clinic, but they're great for, like you said, just overall rotational stability and strength and endurance and really posture, I think is a big thing too. We really didn't talk about that, but that would yeah. even go into like, I mean, we could spend a whole episode on posture and flexibility are two synonymous things too. So I think that's good to mention that really through improving your flexibility, then inherently can kind of affect your posture and through your posture, you can reduce your risk of degeneration and, you know, skeletal changes over time through gravitational, you know, changes and in, in spinal alignment and things like that, that you're just, unfortunately, we're all going to deal with. And the kind of all the things we talked about, if you have a greater threshold of all the, all the five health related fitness components, especially muscular strength, um, that is going to help with those particular things with, with posture for sure. Maybe not so much cardiorespiratory, but mm -hmm. they all do to some degree play into one another. And, uh, I think this was a really good overview today we could go into like each area more specifically if anyone has questions uh definitely don't hesitate to reach out to us shoot us an email and we'll put our information in the description as we always do and we'd be happy either patrick or i or both of us together answer it we could also maybe talk about maybe doing like a uh ask us a question uh episode if people are interested on that and we can just go through questions as we get them and, and film that in the future too, something to consider. But we will have our series, like a two part series on this. This will be part one. And then the next one, we'll talk about our testing and prescription. So that will be, Patrick has a ton of experience in that. And I also have personal experience and can attest to, I've been on the, the Borg test for the VO2 max with Patrick and have seen my VO2 max and can ex explain kind of some of that and the field testing we've done together too. So we can, we can have a good conversation about all of those things. And, and again, ways that you guys can do it at home too, because all these things can be broken down a lot of things too. Like even these, a lot of people have smart watches nowadays. I mean, even these watches do your VO2 max on there too. So there's a lot of ability that you have at your disposal and being more educated on what these metrics are actually telling you is good to know for sure for your health. So. Yeah. And the one like, yeah, speaking of the watch, you know, when you get into, and we'll talk about this in part two, but like, I'm a big Garmin guy, but when you look at, Polar, polar, but pronounced polar. I, I'm always being corrected by my buddy who's like a national sales rep for him. Uh, they will break down how many minutes a day you are like sleeping, sitting down, standing, low intensity, moderate intensity, and vigorous intensity. It will break down your entire day into all of those because our watches and our phones are just accelerometers. You know, what's an accelerometer? It's, you know, uh, if you look at a, a like a little pendulum that's just measuring, you know, up and down an accelerometer is looking at multiple planes. So it's just, as you move throughout the day, it's picking up on different planes and then, Hey, how does it know if you're doing high intensity or low intensity? Well, it's going to base that on how quickly you moved throughout those different planes. But yeah, there's a ton of cool stuff. And, and I think the ultimate goal, which is why I said at the beginning and I tell all the time, I mean, we, we still only scratch the surface. We can go into the weeds on every one of those five health-related physical fitness components. But regardless of where you're at in that fitness 
or health world related to fitness, quality of life, functionality, we can always tie it back to the five health related physical fitness components, you know, and, and I know we, we kept alluding to the skill related physical fitness components. Maybe what we'll do is do like another mini session. So it's like a, a two and a half part series just to quickly touch on the skill related, you know, cause you get into balance coordination, um, reaction time, power and things like that. And those are incredibly important, not just for, you know, an elite athlete, but for someone who's, you know, a driver, an older adult, you know, if a, if a basketball bounces into the front of the road, your reaction time is how quickly you can respond to the stimulus of the basketball coming in the road and how quickly you can interpret that and apply the brake and stuff like that. So balance risk fall. Oh, I want to throw a stat out there, which I should have mentioned before the risk. Why is cardio cardio respiratory is great. That plus flexibility and then incorporate even more so muscular strength and endurance. If somebody over the age of 65 has less muscle mass, they're going to probably not have as good balance, especially if you're not working on flexibility and cardio respiratory decrease your balance. So you now increase that risk of falling. And if you have, you know, if you do stumble, if you can't catch yourself, if you have decreased bone mineral density, you're then going to, when you do fall and falling is at an increased risk, when you do fall, you're going to be at a higher risk of fracturing something like you brought up hip, the mortality, the one year mortality rate of 65 and older meaning you fall and break your hip, what are the chances of you dying dying from falling and breaking your hip within one year? The overall average is like 20 to 25% of one year. And then you go up to five years and that number is like 50%. Like half of the people over the age of 65 who fall and break their hip are going to die within five years. Like that's a crazy statistic. So the point of today is for us to touch on, hey, we talk about cardiovascular disease. We talk about, yeah, you want to be, have more muscles. You, you want to have thicker bones, but it branches out into almost every disease you can think of. That's the, one of the reasons why I love exercise, but we're getting into the health related physical fitness components. We do physical activity and exercise in general to improve our fitness. And then our fitness can then improve almost all aspects of our lives, not just the physical. This is another episode dealing with how physical activity can touch on social health, you know, mental health, et cetera. So um, very excited for the next episode. It was a pleasure as always chatting with you. I uh, appreciate the listeners for sticking us out. This is sort of a much more educational one that, that we know than, than we normally do. But when it comes to stuff like that, again, like knowledge is power, but even better than that knowledge is applied knowledge. And that's what we're going to get into in the next part. Hey, what can we explain the concepts behind it? Now we're going to put into practice how you can use different tools, different training methods and prescription on improving your overall health, functionality, quality of life through the five health related physical fitness components. So Tyler, anything to add? No, I didn't know if you wanted to, I know your website's in the making, but definitely put that in here. Cause, uh, we're going to have our normal outros and, and things of our disclaimer. And I figured that'd be something good for you to add in you. Patrick's yeah. been doing a, just a side note, just a been on a couple other podcasts and they've been really, they've been really awesome. Um, I very much support that Patrick's endeavor to be like a life coach and public speaker is progressing rather quickly. So go ahead and plug your, your information for your uh, website. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we put it always in the show notes and stuff like that, but you know, I love, I love chatting with Tyler, bringing all this wonderful content and these wonderful guests on here at value pursuit. Um, you know, I'm a college professor and a lot, I'm, I'm on a lot of different podcasts as, as guests, particularly in like the sports nutrition, carbohydrate, fitness testing, et cetera. And then more and more, I just became certified as a Maxwell leadership certified um, coach. I do a lot of workshops. I've been doing that for years and I'm starting to pick up. So I'm about to launch a website, patdavitt.com. Uh, you know, so it's something I'm really excited about. Obviously I release a lot of quotes here. I literally gave an exam yesterday and I didn't put a quote on the top of the exam because in exam one, I wrote the quote from 
uh, A.A. Milne from Winnie the Pooh, which says you are stronger than you seem, braver than you believe, and smarter than you think. And it was like, read that before you're about to take this exam. And they asked me for a quote because I didn't put one on the exam. So, but, you know, coaching and, and things like that. And we talk a lot about that, but yeah, I'm about to launch patdavitt.com. And that's going to be a, a one-stop landing where, you know, I have a trail racing company, CTW Endurance, Conquer the World, Valued Pursuit. You know, I'm doing a ton of research and stuff in the lab, but then my heart and passion is related to kind of everything we embody on this show, but then taking it and, you know, I'm a, just speaking publicly, doing workshops, presentations on nutrition, fitness, sort of mental conditioning, quality of life, stuff like that. So appreciate the shout out, man. Of course, man. I'm proud of you. Congrats on the uh, Maxwell uh, certification Thanks. you got to. That's awesome. And I, I definitely check out that episode too, because I listened to that. We can put that information into the the most uh, recent uh, the one that you had on there. That's the first time, yeah. yeah, I revealed sort of my story. And that was the first podcast I was on where it's just, it was all about like, motivation, inspiration, overcoming dark times, sad times and stuff like that, that no matter where you're at in life, there's always somewhere for you to go that is better than where you're currently at. You just have to figure out where it is and then realize, you know, that you don't want to stay where you are. So awesome. awesome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks everyone. Um, we look forward to sharing this with you and then Tyler and I getting into part two. All right. Thank you for listening and we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Thank you for being here and taking a step towards growth. As the saying goes, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. We look forward to sharing more expertise and content with you. And we want to hear from you about what topics you're interested in learning more about. Please share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're enjoying this experience, please like, subscribe, and share with others who could benefit. Our goal is to grow the show and bring on more valuable guests to provide relevant content for your life. Thank you for joining us on this mission to spread knowledge and connect with people around the world. The Valued Pursuit podcast and content posted by Valued Pursuit is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. The use of information on this podcast or materials link from this podcast or website are at the user's own risk. It is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, medical, psychotherapist, or any other qualified professional diagnosis or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical or mental health condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such condition. You ever have a vision? Something you see play out before it happens? They say that the scariest thing in life is not growing into your potential not recognizing the person you were created to be. We are on a mission to help everyone on this planet chase that version of you, your most fulfilled self. Created here in the USA, Brian Co. is now releasing their one-off hoodie in a full zip design, premium quality fitted to your physique to show you are chasing greatness in all aspects of life. Wear a garment that shows your potential evolving over a lifetime and become a part of a brand where humans connect to knock down the obstacles they face for endless refinement and continuous improvement.